In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at some more specific deductions. We're going to start off with car expenses. Now, you may recall that for earlier specific forms of deduction, such as home office, food and entertainment and such like, I made the point that cars, like all those other classes, is something that most of us have, certainly most taxpayers have or have access to. And thus, because of that, and because uh, I guess the ease in which people can use these sorts of expenses to manipulate the tax affairs, the car expenses and the deductions that can be made from those are very carefully mapped out by Parliament and by the Commissioner. And it may also be helpful to note that in recent times, the car expense deduction has been simplified. Um, you may note, particularly if you're referring to earlier texts, that there used to be four methods that a taxpayer could elect to go about uh, deducting car expenses. Now that's been reduced to two. The first of these, and the, arguably the simplest, is the cents per kilometre method. This is dead simple. In any particular tax year, count up the number of kilometres that you drive, a vehicle that, that, um, that you have, and multiply that by 66 cents. There's a couple of things to note here. Uh, first of all, the, the old rule of um, having a different rate or a differential depending on the car's engine capacity or engine, um, or displacement, which you know, was generally used as a proxy for the size of the vehicle. Uh, that's been dis disregarded and just replaced by a flat 66 cents. However, one very important consideration that has been retained is the 5,000 business kilometre cap. And it's basically self-explanatory. You can use the cents per kilometre method only for the first 5,000 kilometres that you do. Now, in a situation where a taxpayer has exceeded that, the tax office will allow the deduction, still at the 66 cents per kilometre, but only for the first 5,000. And a taxpayer can elect which of the two methods to choose. So uh, if in a situation like this, we've gone over the 5,000 Ks, you can simply calculate what the rate or the amount of deduction would be. Uh, in this case, it's $3,300. And then just compare that with the other method, the logbook method. And again, the logbook method is slightly self-explanatory. It um, requires the taxpayer to substantiate the business kilometres that have been made with a vehicle uh, by keeping a logbook. Basically, when um, a person goes to jump in the vehicle to go and drive somewhere, uh, to track what the odometer currently is, and then whether or not that particular um, trip is for business or for non-business use. And essentially, it's just a fraction. So if the vehicle has done, say, 100,000 kilometres in the course of the tax year, half of which is for um, business, half for private, essentially half of the expenses relating to the vehicle during that period can be claimed. And so that's the, uh, I guess, the straightforward basic things, the cost of fuel, uh, oil and lubricants, car washes, um, insurance and registration, uh, as well as the interest on uh, loans that a person, a taxpayer may incur in order to uh, purchase that vehicle. And the taxpayer can claim depreciation on that vehicle. Now, it's highly recommended when answering a structured question that uses a formula, such as this one, that you write out the formula in full, or at least in as a method which is clear to the person sort of reading it that these are the steps to take and these are the items that make up those steps. So here, for example, the formula is from the 97 Act in section 40-72. That's for assets acquired after 2006. And the amount of deduction for depreciation in, in this particular tax year is equal to the base value multiplied by the number of days held divided by 365 multiplied by 200%, which is the same as multiplying by 2, and then divided by the useful life. Now, for each of those items, the important ones to note are uh, here that the base value is $50,000, because this is the first year um, that this taxpayer has held the vehicle, and the useful life is determined by the commissioner. It's eight years for motor vehicles in most situations. And thus, plugging those numbers into that formula, 50,000 times 365, divided by 365 times 2 divided by 8 is $12,500 for the base depreciation on this motor vehicle. 
And so the next step is just to add all of these things up. Uh, the interest, registration, insurance, repairs, uh, fuel oil, car washes, and depreciation to get a sum of 21,800. And then and the final step to make a note of the business use percentage. So here it's 50%. And these car expenses, which are deductible, uh, can only be deducted uh, by the taxpayer to the extent of 50% of that $21,800. And so the final result, the final answer for this, is a $10,900 deduction. Now just make note, when uh, calculating this result for the logbook method, go back and compare it to the uh, cents per kilometre method. And there, $3,300 is clearly a lot less than this. And so in this situation, the taxpayer would elect to use the logbook method in order to maximise the amount of deductions for this particular year and thus minimise the tax outlay. Here we're looking at tax accounting and the election of a taxpayer to use one accounting method, be it the cash or the accruals method, in order to um, determine when the taxpayer actually incurs uh, income. And so for that situation, determine how and when they become liable for paying tax on these amounts. So just make note, the entity here is a firm of solicitors. And importantly, you have two partners as well as two employed solicitors and some office staff as well. And so the question here is asking, well, which method should we use if, uh, at the moment when we've got the two partners and then after this particular change? And um, the third part of this question is asking you to think about which of the methods is preferable. What's the best strategy to take in this situation? And so the starting point for tax accounting is that, and this is expressed um, by Justice Gibbs in Brent, that the choice of tax accounting method, be it cash or accruals, should substantially reflect what the taxpayer's true income is. And here we can sort of delve into a series of cases um, where the court's held one way or another, depending on the circumstances of those particular taxpayers. So in Cardin and in Fistenberg and in Dunn, the court said, well, look, in situations where you've got professionals with small entities where most, if not all, of the income is directly derived by the partners themselves, then it probably is most appropriate to use the cash method for determining when income is actually derived. However, if you move into a larger situation, and most importantly, a situation where you have non-partner employees, so people that, in this case, solicitors that you're employing, they're having billable hours, but you're really sort of gathering the fruits of their labor. And in that situation, the correct reflex is really derived from looking at the performance of the firm as an entity, as a whole. And in that situation, the courts have said, look, there, when you reach that sort of size, the accruals basis is the more appropriate reflection of what the, the taxpayer's true income actually is. And so in this situation where if we start with two partners and two employed staff, it probably is most appropriate to use the accruals basis of tax accounting. However, if one of those partners retires and the two employee solicitors are not retained, in other words, it goes back to just being one person essentially operating as a sole trader. Then in that situation, the taxpayer's real underlying income should flow from when they perform the service and um, in that situation, uh, when the money's received. So it should be noted here that this is really the reverse of Henderson's case. In that situation, it was moving from cash to accruals. But arguably here, when the partner retires and the employee solicitors are, are terminated, then we would be moving from accruals back to cash. And so if we think about sort of the underlying uh, strategy that the firm would take at this point, or the remaining partner, that if we move from the accrual system, where uh, income's derived at the point when it's invoiced and not when the cash is received, if we have accounts towards the end of the year, end of the tax year, and we're using the accruals basis, we're going to have to pay tax on them when we issue the invoice. And if we switch base to cash, well, in theory, then we're going to be paying cash, um, sorry, paying tax when 
the money then comes in. So essentially, we're going to be paying tax twice. And that's problematic and is noted in the solution here. Well, what might have been a, a useful strategy here is to arrange for all of the debtors to be, um, to be purchased as part of the restructure when you do the buyout. That's one thing to, um, to contemplate. And it's also important to note that if this business was restructured, but the employees had stayed uh, along with the firm, then in that situation, they probably would retain the accruals basis for tax accounting. So the next thing we're going to look at is the Arthur Murray principle. And really that's to do with situations where you have uh, sort of small uh, cash-based taxpayers taking prepayments. Here, for example, we have a taxpayer who's running a, a beauty school who takes money uh, from people in advance to do lessons. And, and this is quite important, her business practice is such that although the contract strictly says no refunds, she is in the habit of refunding people if that particular service is not performed at that subsequent date after the end of the tax year. Now, again, when trying to determine which of the tax accounting methods that, uh, that this taxpayer would start with, we look again from Brent's case to, uh, to see which of those provides, substantially provides the correct reflection of the taxpayer's underlying or true income. And where we have somebody uh, performing personal services and accepting cash for those services, usually they're going to be on the cash basis. However, this um, difficulty arises when the taxpayer starts accepting prepayments. Because if you think about it, that's more in the style of invoicing, essentially, particularly if the money is refunded at the later stage. If the money is not refunded, then Arthur Murray arguably wouldn't apply here. Here, though, she does. And as such, the appropriate mechanism for recording this is really on what they call the profits emerging um, accruals basis. Now, from a very sort of practical perspective, that requires her to maintain a sort of a series of journals or to have a particular suspense account whereby the money is drawn down after each of those services are performed or after the date that the service was supposed to be uh, performed has, um, has passed. And so the last thing to note here is that if she has been, and probably has been, accounting on the cash basis of tax accounting. Switching to this Arthur Murray uh, accounting method requires her to include income in tax year two, which she's already paid tax on in tax year one, by that where she's taken the money as the prepayment and accounted for that on the cash basis as being taxable. She would have paid tax on it there. And then switching to Arthur Murray means that she would have changed um, to this profits emerging uh, idea. And then in theory is actually paying tax on both of those figures at, at the later um, period in tax year two. So,